Lift every voice and sing, telling the stories of Decatur's African American heritage. Discover the people, places, and events that inspire and enlighten. Religion was a foundation for Decatur families. Churches met spiritual needs and were places to educate and socialize. King's Memorial United Methodist, formerly known as St. Paul's Methodist Episcopal, is Decatur's oldest African-American church. It was established when slaves who were members of the predominantly white Methodist church decided to build their own house of worship. Richard and Charity Rather were leaders in the so-called colored church. The original building was destroyed by Union soldiers. The church was renamed King's Memorial in 1908 in honor of Bishop Willis Jefferson King. First Baptist Colored, known today as First Missionary Baptist, is listed on the Alabama Register of Historic Places. Reverend Alfred Peters and about two dozen members organized in April of 1866. In 1919, church leaders purchased the present property on Vine Street. Prominent African-American architect W.A. Rayfield designed the church, which was constructed in 1921. Rayfield also designed the historic 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, where Dr. Martin Luther King preached during the Civil Rights Movement. It has significance if it is for the making of a better world. Elder Bertha Polk Lau was Decatur's first African-American female preacher. She was the daughter of a former slave and well-known for drawing big crowds with her powerful, soul-convicting sermons. In December of 2010, Wayman Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal, and Garner Memorial CME were added to the Alabama Register of Historic Places. Other significant churches include St. Stephen's Primitive Baptist and Shiloh Missionary Baptist. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the church formed the heartbeat of Decatur's African-American experience. Former Decatur slaves knew education would be the key to success for future generations. The Freedmen's Aid Society operated a school at St. Paul's Church in 1867 after emancipation. This school would later become Decatur's first public school for colored children. In 1875, Professor Henry Clifton opened Decatur's first private school at St. Stephen's Primitive Baptist Church. A school board of trustees was organized in 1890. The turn of the century brought many new opportunities for African Americans, but they continued their focus on education. In the 1920s, another new school was constructed on Cherry Street and became known as Decatur Negro High. World-famous agricultural scientist Dr. George Washington Carver delivered the Baccalaureate Address to the class of 1935. An integrated audience of more than a thousand people gathered at the Princess Theater to hear the speech. Carver Elementary became the first school in Alabama named after Dr. George Washington Carver. The 1960s brought many changes and challenges. By now, Lakeside High had developed a solid reputation for academic excellence but the civil rights movement and desegregation were on the horizon. Like many others throughout the state, Decatur citizens were uncertain about the future as African-American students were transferred to predominantly white schools. In 1969, the last senior class graduated from Lakeside High. Today, the site serves as an elementary magnet school. Now, it's named in honor of Leon Sheffield, Lakeside's first principal. African-American leaders who envisioned a brighter future laid the foundation to provide generations of children the educational opportunities they themselves were denied. Decatur's African-American pioneers courageously led the transition from a predominantly agricultural workforce into skilled positions involving trade, business, and professional service. Robert Murphy's life reflects that transition he was born a slave in 1831, but he died a successful farmer and landowner. Ironically, much of the 300 acres he farmed was land he once worked as a slave. Another success story, the life of Matthew H. Banks. He was a thriving businessman, landowner, and community leader. Banks served as Decatur's second black councilman. Because of his knowledge of antebellum Decatur, Banks testified on behalf of local congregations making claims for damage to their churches after the war. 
the Banks family would remain active in church, civic, educational, and political leadership roles. Athlene Banks was an accomplished educator and Decatur's first black female principal. A beloved humanitarian and philanthropist, Athlene Banks' legacy is recognized today in the naming of Banks Connell Elementary School in her honor. The Sykes family also played an important role in the history of Decatur. Solomon Sykes was born on the Garth Sykes Plantation, but he also died a successful businessman. Sykes owned a saloon, furniture store, and a funeral home. The entire city of Decatur shut down for one hour upon his death in 1920. His brother, Charles Sykes, was one of the longest serving black city councilmen. Sykes Cemetery, originally called the Magnolia, was placed on the Alabama Historic Register in 2010. As time progressed, many other businesses and occupations became associated with the black community, including Burl Lemon, who was a blacksmith, hotel owner, and grocer. He was also Decatur's first black city councilman after Reconstruction. Samuel Shawtees and Robert Chartervane were local shoe and boot makers. Their names were stamped proudly in the bottom of each shoe they made. The Cashin family also blazed new trails in Decatur. Former slave Herschel Cashin settled in the 1880s. He first served as a railroad clerk and as a city councilman in the 1890s. Cashin helped organize the Decatur Land Company. Dr. Newland Cashin was one of only a few African-American physicians in Decatur. The Cashin Housing Complex and Cashin Street are named in his honor. The legacy of the Sturz family gives evidence to the rising professional black community. Dr. Willis Sturz owned Magnolia Pharmacy and the Cottage Home Infirmary and Medical School. He graduated from the University of Michigan and is believed to be Decatur's first black physician. His wife, Eva Young Sturz, published Decatur's first African-American newspaper called The Guardian. Today, the Eva Sturz Boys Club is named in her honor. From bondage to respected members of the community, African-Americans paved the way for new career choices. Although African-Americans faced many challenges, they realized the importance of social and cultural activities that brought families together. They turned to the Guardian newspaper to find out about upcoming events such as supper clubs, meeting of the Negro Civic Club, politics, and sports. Decatur produced great athletes such as Dr. Frank Sykes. He began his baseball career while attending Howard University. Sykes became a famous pitcher in the Negro Baseball League with the Baltimore Black Sox. He also earned a degree as a dentist. Another Decatur native played professional baseball in the Negro League. Billy Vaughn gained popularity on third base with the Indianapolis Clowns. Citizens were able to enjoy cultural and social gatherings because patriotism was strong throughout the community, and many servicemen and women demonstrated their allegiance to their country by serving in the armed forces. <laughs> Private Amos McKinney served during the Civil War. In fact, he served in the 1st Alabama Cavalry, which was an integrated regiment. The Alabama Constitution in 1901 contained language that prevented most African Americans from voting. Dr. Willis Sturz knew brighter days were ahead and wrote an impassioned letter to the Constitutional Convention, urging delegates to embrace his race in the political process. His letter moved many but had no outcome of the convention. Even though there was no progress, a few brave pioneers who met the unreasonable requirements for voters continued to cast their ballots. Many of the injustices suffered by African Americans in Alabama and across the South were put in the spotlight during the infamous Scottsboro Boys trial. It happened in the 1930s. Nine young black defendants were accused of raping two white women. The trials were held in Decatur. The defense was able to successfully show that blacks were systematically and unconstitutionally excluded from the jury process. Several of Decatur's professional black citizens testified that none of them had been contacted for jury duty. The Supreme Court ruled that the Scottsboro Boys were denied due process. As a result, jury commissions across the South began immediately adding African Americans to their jury pool. The Scottsboro Boys trial produced many landmark Supreme Court decisions that would begin to correct many injustices. We're all a part of a great choir singing the song of Decatur's past. 
a rich hymn embracing many voices and a diverse human experience. These blended voices give note to our past and shape a more harmonious future, remembering these courageous pioneers who have inspired us with their stories of determination and faith.